Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this series of monthly webinars by the Heart Failure Association of India. This is the fifth webinar that we are hosting, and the object is to focus on one particular aspect of heart failure or related subjects and to ask to get some experts to talk on that, followed by a question and answer session. We have already dealt with peripartum cardiomyopathy, cardio oncology, arrhythmias and devices, and advanced heart failure with the management of advanced heart failure with transplant and LBSS devices. Today, we are going to discuss a subject which is equally important in patients' lives, but somehow or the other, it is not discussed that frankly in many of the communities. And I think it is particularly for a population like India, that many of these subjects are considered either relatively taboo or people are relatively shy of discussing them. But these are extremely important for patients' well being and their welfare. We have three wonderful experts. To go to, who are going to talk on these subjects. So let me invite Dr. Hari to take this forward. Thank you, Dr. Chopra. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, these three topics which we are going to discuss today are uh, actually affecting the quality of life of patients, and they also affect uh, the morbidity and mortality of patients with heart failure. So we thought it would be very important to discuss uh, this topic in this forum. So we have uh, three uh, international experts in this field who will uh, take on this topic. Uh, to have to moderate uh, these sessions, we have two stalwarts, uh, Dr. Gurpreet Wander and uh, Dr. Uh, Iyengar uh, from Bangalore. So I invite uh, both of them uh, to initiate the proceeding. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Martin Covey, uh, Professor of Cardiology at Imperial College London and Royal Brompton Hospital. He is also Chair of Digital Health Committee, European Society of Cardiology. All of us are very familiar with him, his uh, papers and his talks. And uh, of course, let us set aside the recent India versus England cricket matches. Come back to Professor Covey for his talk. Uh, uh, Professor Kobe, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's a great pleasure and thank you for inviting me to take part in this Hartford Association of India seminar. So I just want to spend 20 minutes or so talking and updating you on sleep disordered breathing and heart failure. And it's a very interesting topic and not at all as we expected it to turn out. These are my declarations of interest. I've done a lot of research in uh, sleep apnea and heart failure and uh, have been interacting with those interested in the innovation in that space for some time. So just to remind ourselves, what is sleep apnea? Well, apnea, of course, is the absence of airflow. It has to be for 10 seconds or more to count as an apnea. And the other thing that's more common than an apnea is a hypopnea, where you have reduction in airflow. And there's two basic forms of sleep apnea. The most common one in the population that you'll all be familiar with as cardiologists is obstructive sleep apnea usually in an obese individual, often diabetic and hypertensive. You can also find that in heart failure. And then the other form of uh, sleep apnea is central sleep apnea, which is generally found in heart failure, also can be found in atrial fibrillation, and also in people that are chronically taking opioids. So those are the two basic forms, so that's an oversimplification of the process, but let's tackle it in that way just to keep it nice and simple. So not talking about heart failure here, but the more common forms of obstructive sleep apnea, you'd recognize that when you're lecturing, it's the person that falls asleep in the front row like this gentleman. So he hasn't slept well overnight, keeps waking himself up when he obstructs his airway. So he has to catch up with sleep during the day. And if it's quiet, or if he's reading a book, listening to a lecture, he will nod off. Tends to be overweight, tends to have retronachism with the jaw being small, and often there is metabolic abnormalities such as diabetes, uh, hypertension, etc. So this is very common. You can do a, a simple measurement of this with the Epworth sleepiness scale. 
And you just ask people under these circumstances, are you likely to doze off or are you not? And you end up with a score. And these people have daytime sleepiness. And if it's very severe, of course, it can be dangerous for driving. And that's a major reason for picking up obstructive sleep apnea in your general clinics. I'm not talking about heart failure at this point. You know what happens in obstructive sleep apnea? The clue is in the name. So there's obstruction of the upper airway. And this can create noise such as snoring. So the bed partner will probably be very aware of the obstructive sleep apnea, even if the patient not so much. But sometimes it can occur without very much noise, so not so much snoring. The modern treatment of this has really been changed over the years with great improvements in the technology. So the machines that provide continuous positive airway pressure to keep the airway open are now small and much quieter. The air can be humidified easily, and quite often it's not a huge uh, mask over the face. It may just be nasal pillows. So just in case you're not completely up to date, the technology is now very much easier for patients to use and to treat their obstructive sleep apnea. The evidence is that if you're very sleepy during the day because of obstructive sleep apnea, you can have a big improvement in your quality of life with treatment of this. So very important to pick up. This is the diagnostic um, traces that you get from polygraphy or, or actually polysomnography. And that's the gold standard. And it used to be done just in hospital, the patient's wired up, you can see what's happening with the airflow, but you can also see what's happening to the chest wall and the abdomen and what's happening to oxygen saturation. So in panel A at the top of the slide, you can see the uh, apnea with a flat line there of airflow. And then you can see the thorax and the abdomen still trying to breathe against that obstructed airway. You get a drop in saturation, you get often get a drop in blood pressure and then a surge as this is released. And that's when the patient goes into a lighter stage of sleep. And this occurs repetitively overnight, 15, 20, up to 40 times an hour this can be happening. The bottom panel is the other form of sleep apnea, and this is where there's a drop in respiratory drive. So often not an obstructive element, it's just your respiratory center is no longer uh, asking your thorax and abdominal muscles to contract and for you to breathe. And there's various forms of this, including chain stokes, which is very cyclical uh, waxing and waning of, of breathing. Not so much obstructive element, it's the central phenomenon that we find in heart failure. It's easy to screen for this now, so you don't have to do hospital-based polysomnography. Now, there are a lot of devices of different levels that can be used, and even overnight oximetry, so a simple device that can measure the oxygen level and record that overnight, can give you a clue that your patient has got sleep apnea. Very useful tool. And you can see on the slide here, there are increasing degrees of sophistication as to what kind of testing that can be done. But a lot of this is now done at home, out of hospital. So question now, let's move to heart failure. Is sleep disorder breathing common in our heart failure patients? Well, just two snapshot studies here, one from my own group at the Brompton in London. We looked at 55 men with heart failure, uh, HEF-REF, mild symptoms of heart failure and good therapy, and half of them had sleep apnea. Central was about 40%. And 15% or so had obstructive sleep apnea. Another study from Germany, much larger series of patients, and including women here, you can see about half of patients will have good going sleep apnea with an apnea hypopnea index of at least 15. So 15 events every hour at least whilst they're asleep. And once again, central sleep apnea is more common in heart failure patients. If you look at how this relates to the severity of heart failure, the sicker your patient, the more symptoms they have of heart failure, the more likely they will have central sleep apnea. So you can see this huge gradation across the symptom level. And in fact, if your patient's got severe heart failure, particularly if they're in atrial fibrillation, and particularly if they're male, virtually all of them will have central sleep apnea. Women are protected. Um, they have a lower likelihood of going into chain stokes or central sleep apnea, but it can still develop. And you can see this across the spectrum of severity. This slide looks complicated, but it's just to make the point that uh, it's not just about a reduction in airflow 
uh, in this syndrome. There's lots of things happening, and particularly in severe obstructive sleep apnea, the pressure inside the chest cavity can be very, very negative during this. You're trying to breathe against a closed airway and your negative pressure is enormous. And you get these swings of pressure uh, reflected also in systemic pressure in venous return and sympathetic activation. And this is occurring repetitively every few minutes, anytime you go to sleep. So you can imagine that this might not be good for your heart, but there are many other things going on. And there seems to be a lot of clustering of sympathetic overactivation of oxidative stress, increased thrombosis, and endothelial dysfunction. So a complete panoply of different abnormalities associated with a sleep apnea syndrome. We know also the more severe your sleep apnea, the worse your prognosis. So it's a very good prognostic marker. Here's a series from France looking at that, looking at whether you have got mild sleep apnea or not. And in this study, here, you can see that the central sleep apnea do the worst. Structive sleep apnea are still not doing great. Um, and if you have no sleep apnea and heart failure, you're actually in a lower risk group. So definitely detecting it will tell you about the prognosis of the patient, but is that sufficient? We know that the more severe your, your symptoms of heart failure, the more likely you will have sleep apnea. So it kind of may just be a marker of the severity of your heart failure syndrome. We also know if you have an ICD that it's more likely to fire if you have uncontrolled sleep apnea and not much difference between obstructive and central here. We can see the firing of these ICDs in a large German series here. So it is telling us something about the prognosis of the patient and the severity of the pathophysiological abnormalities. But does it make a difference? Should we be targeting this? Should we be treating it? Or should we just get on and treat the heart failure better? Now, certainly for central sleep apnea, if you treat heart failure better, decrease the congestion, make the lungs less fluid loaded, then you will improve the central sleep apnea. So under diuretics, uh, under diuresis of your patient is bad. They'll get worse central sleep apnea. So please, please, please treat the heart failure properly. You can see on the left there, CRT device going into a heart failure patient, the central sleep apnea gets much better. So it's a reflection of cardiac output, pulmonary congestion, etc. On the right, just an interesting patient of mine that had very marked central sleep apnea, an LVAD was put in. And when you switch the LVAD on, central sleep apnea immediately disappears. Switch the LVAD off, it immediately reappears. It's just a reflection of cardiac output and venous pressure in the lungs. But the really interesting bit, of course, was saying, well, okay, we understand it's a marker of risk. What about treating specifically the sleep apnea? So this was a big million dollar question, uh, or maybe billion dollar for some companies, about 10 years ago or so. Wouldn't it make sense to go in, diagnose the sleep apnea, treat it, and the patients would do better? So what's the evidence for that? Well, this is an interesting story. It's really developed over the last decade very small randomized trial called the CAMPAP study, just about 260 patients. This was taking people with HEFREF and central sleep apnea, treating them with CPAP therapy, which helps the, the central sleep apnea, but helps the patients. Well, this trial was stopped early. They were worried initially there was a signal of harm that that seemed to disappear. And overall, it doesn't seem to make any difference to transplant free survival. But there were a lot of things pointing in a positive direction. So BMP levels dropped, ejection fraction seemed to increase, patients said that they felt better. So a further publication from CANPAP came out two years later. This is post hoc and said, okay, let's take the patients who couldn't tolerate it out, the ones that didn't get control of their central sleep apnea, and just look at those who had great reduction in their uh, apnea and did how did they do? And you can see in this published in circulation, if you could control the central sleep apnea with CPAP, these patients seem to do extremely well. So this is taken as an encouraging signal that if you could identify the patients, get them onto positive airway pressure and control it so that they were compliant with it throughout the night, you might make a big difference. This is where I picked up on the story and became the principal investigator for the world's largest study of treatment of sleep apnea in heart failure. 
We didn't use CPAP, we used something else called uh, servo-assisted ventilation, ASV. It's more intelligent, it controls central sleep apnea and chain stroke much better than CPAP. It's better tolerated. So we thought, let's take the best airway pressure technology, apply it to patients with obvious HEF ref, obvious central sleep apnea, and surely it will demonstrate benefit. So the study was called SERVHF, and it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2015. And let me just tell you what kind of patients were in it, how well we did, and then the surprising results of the study. So as I said, we took HEFREF patients, broad spectrum of severity, good, op and good medical therapy, and they had to have good going central sleep apnea. 1,325 patients, so hugely bigger than the CAMPAP study, and we also followed them up for longer. This was the overall result. All of that effort in 91 centers recruiting to this study, no difference in cardiovascular hard endpoints by treating the central sleep apnea. And these patients, we got really good control of the central sleep apnea, it was always got rid of, but you can see here, no difference in outcome. Slight signal perhaps that there was harm, but it wasn't significant, these curves are the same. However, when we looked at it in more detail, if you look at cardiovascular mortality, we actually increased it by 34% by treating their central sleep apnea. 34% increased death rate from cardiovascular, very unlikely to be due to chance. And subsequently, we did other work. And if you look at the red square there, these are the patients with the lowest ejection fractions in our study. Look at the difference of sudden death in that group. By getting rid of the central sleep apnea, we increased the risk of sudden death fivefold. So we, these patients were dying suddenly at a much higher rate. I'm not sure of the mechanism. It doesn't seem to be tachyarrhythmia. It may well be pulseless electromechanical dissociation or even um, asystole that's occurring in these hearts so that they don't respond to pacing. We don't know, but there's a big increase in sudden death by getting rid of the central sleep apnea. So that was very interesting, very surprising indeed. And the share price of the company behind this dropped like a bomb when we produced these results. It's now recovered, but you can see that this wasn't at all what we expected. Then we discovered, of course, that there's a bit of literature suggesting that chain stokes may actually be helpful for a patient with heart failure. Uh, hyperventilation periods of that and damps down the sympathetic nervous system, increases vagal tone, produces some positive airway pressure um, and other reasons why it might actually be helpful for a patient with severe heart failure. So chain strokes may not always be bad. It's a mark of the severity of the syndrome. But if you get rid of it with positive airway pressure, the patients do worse. But I'm only talking here about central sleep apnea, not obstructive sleep apnea. So the jury is still out on that. A trial we think has concluded, it's taken 11 years to recruit uh, patients. And this is looking more broadly, not just central sleep apnea, but obstructive sleep apnea in HEFREF patients. And we hope that this study called ADVENT HF will publish its results later this year. So we will see then if it's the same story for obstructive sleep apnea as it is for central. So heart failure patients are special um, we have to think carefully about benefit as well as harm. So just in summary, uh, what should you do about sleep apnea and heart failure? Well, I think at the moment, do not think that if your patient's got good going heart failure, and they happen to have chain stokes or central sleep apnea, please don't treat them routinely with positive airway pressure. You may actually do harm. If, however, they have HEFPEF, or if they don't have severe reduction injection fraction and they're very sleepy during the day because they've got obstructive sleep apnea, then think about CPAP therapy, but think about it. Is it going to improve things? Is it the right treatment for this patient? Are you doing harm? And in fact, what I generally say to people is, please just diagnose the heart failure correctly and treat it as best you can. That is the best way of treating sleep apnea in heart failure patients. If you'd like to read more uh, reviews of the area, it's an exciting area, it's developing all the time. 
pop my name into PubMed, and here are just five or six recent publications that review sleep apnea and cardiovascular disease. So thank you very much for attention. Very happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Koi, for that uh, very elegant presentation on uh, sleep disordered breathing in heart failure patients. Uh, let me see if there are any questions in the chat box. Uh, while uh, we look at Dr. Martin, how has it, it affected your clinical practice? Like what percentage of your patients are uh, today uh, advised uh, CPAP in clinical practice with these results that you have seen? And uh, do you make an effort to distinguish between obstructive and uh, uh, central sleep apnea? And what percentage of ca cases have an overlap of both? Yeah, it's a great question. So in my practice changed completely once we published results of SAB. I was looking for central sleep apnea. I was finding it in all of my heart failure patients and I was treating it with, with ASB therapy. As soon as we got the trial results, I stopped doing that because we were killing some of these patients by doing that. So I don't now go looking routinely for sleep apnea in my heart failure patients. However, I have many patients who don't have heart failure, but are obese, diabetic, hypertensive, sleepy during the day, nodding off, watching television, reading a book or driving. And it's really important to identify obstructive sleep apnea in that population and to treat it because that really does help daytime sleepiness and to be very positive with the patient about the need to do that, hopefully as they lose weight, et cetera, and get better control. In terms of the overlap syndrome, there are a lot of patients who start the night um, with uh, central and become more obstructive as the night goes on. There are some episodes that start off central and become obstructive. And sometimes when you treat um, obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep pattern then appears. It's called treatment emergent central sleep apnea. So I've oversimplified the story here. And I think basically for heart failure patients, if it's important, then um, you need to do a study, but you need to think about it and discuss it with your respiratory or sleep colleagues to make the right decision. And the final point is heart failure patients are protected from daytime sleepiness. They, even if they have good going obstructive sleep apnea, they're not very sleepy. And the reason we think is the sympathetic activation due to the heart failure syndrome keeps them awake. So it's a, it's a complex, very different from general cardiology, the heart failure area. Sorry, a long answer to a short question. But very useful. Yeah. Uh, so, Kobe, is it uh, uh, essential that we do sleep studies in all patients of heart failure or the discharge from the hospital? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you do. Or are you asking me? Yeah. Do you recommend? No, I don't. I used to. Um, but when we got the results of SARV, we stopped doing that because it's just a waste of effort and there's a temptation to treat the test result rather than the patient and think what's best for them. So what I often say to my respiratory colleagues, yes, my patient has central sleep apnea. Even the, the, their wife can tell you they've got central sleep apnea. They describe their breathing at night. But what I need to do is treat the heart failure better, optimize them, decongest them, That'll make that better. And that's a safe way of doing it. Do not treat the central sleep apnea on its own merits in that particular patient. But you're right. We don't know much about HFPEF. We don't know so much about that. We don't know about acute heart failure with central sleep apnea is virtually universal. A small study was started that had to stop after sarv hf because of severe uh, uh, concern about harm. So my advice is look for sleep apnea in your general cardiology patients, your diabetics, your obese, your hypertensive, and treat the obstruction there. Central sleep apnea, we need a lot more research. There's a potential to do harm. Secondly, you made a statement that uh, uh, there is no longer can be surrogate endpoints of improvement in uh, respiratory and sleep metrics be taken as adequate support of outcome measures but we could take other surrogate measures like quality of life? Yes, it's an interesting question actually. We did that in SARV and actually a lot of our patients felt better on central, uh, on treatment. They said about 40% said they felt better on ASV therapy than before. Sadly, some of those people died suddenly. So we, we made them feel better and then they died suddenly. That's not great medicine. Um, and also in the control arm, about 40% also said they felt better. So there's a strong placebo effect. There's also the fact you recruit when they're sickest and then they're getting better. 
quite complex. A lot of my respiratory colleagues were furious when the results came out. They said, this is really bad. You know, my patients tell me they feel better. They like this therapy, something I can do. And I said, well, the ones that die suddenly don't come back and thank you. So it's really important to look at it in the round. So that's why I'm not a great fan of surrogates. So just because you improve the EHI um, is not a marker of therapeutic success. And that's why we do the randomized trials and really surprised us. So we have to go back and think about it more carefully. Very interesting area. But I think in the Indian tradition of medicine, the British tradition of medicine, it's always about let's examine it. Let's get all the information. Let's think about it um, and try and come up with the best answer. Uh, any other questions from uh, chairpersons? Uh, Dr. Martin, uh, I know we're overshooting time, but still, uh, in my clinical practice, sometimes patients who come recurrently with heart failure, uh, I advise them domiciliary oxygen therapy, but I also give them at times a BiPAP, which intermittently they use uh, whenever they become sick. Uh, what is your take on such a uh, practice? Yeah, I think it's good. I, I'm not sure about the BiPAP. I, I would be concerned that with the central sleep apnea, you might be causing harm in some patients. Um, the oxygen level is a very good question. And, you know, heart failure patients, particularly if they've got lung congestion, can have low levels of hypoxia, and it can get worse during episodes of sleep apnea and hypopnea. There's a big trial going on in the States now called, I, know, I can't remember the name of it, Red. No, I can't remember. But a big study run in the States looking at home oxygen for heart failure patients to see if they do better. So the jury's out on that at the moment. Randomized trial underway, uh, led by Susan Redline. Um, can we go to the second talk, Dr. Hari? Uh, now we go to the uh, second talk. Uh, I have great pl uh, pleasure in introducing uh, Dr. Chitra Venkateshan. Uh, she is my batchmate. Uh, and she is currently uh, the professor of uh, uh, cardio, uh, professor of uh, uh, professor in psychiatry and palliative care at Believers Search Medical College in uh, Tiruvalla, Kerala. She is a consultant in psycho oncology and the founder clinical director of Mehak Foundation a not-for-profit organization aiming to deliver exceptional care to improve the quality of life of people with mental illness in the community, especially people who are chained at their homes, etc. She is doing a wonderful job in rehabilitating those patients. Her focus is to strengthen an important perspective on the neglected area of mental health and palliative care within NCD programs. And she is leading the ICMR National Center of Excellence in Mental Health. And her research mainly focuses on psychological distress and implementation of models and pathways for psychosocial care. Over to you, Dr. Chitra. Uh, thank you, Hari. Thanks a lot. Uh, as Hari said, uh, my background is from mental health. I'm a psychiatrist and, uh, and also a palliative care physician. And this is my first step in cardiology. And uh, I probably am looking at a group of people who deal with the heart in a very different way from how I deal. We deal with coping and you deal with pumping. So uh, this is the first. Uh, but my main, main interest would be to look into how we could integrate. So my role in oncology and palliative care as a mental health professional was to integrate systems of assessing di uh, distress. So uh, that would be the main intention here. So I'll just go on with the presentation. So, we know that emotional is understandable. All of us go through our emotional distress. We have fear, we have sadness, we respond to changes in our life. But this uh, increases or exacerbates immensely when there is an illness which is very chronic or at end of life. And we all know that. And it was my natural inclination to look into some qualitative studies as evidence of people living with uh, you know, uh, depression, it, it, with heart failure, with depression. And four main themes emerged. So there was there were quite a few uh, studies and you could see that, you know, people are saying that they are living in the shadow of fear. They're running out empty. They are living a restricted life. They are battling the system. You can see read quotes like, am I going to come out of this? Am I going to die? You know, is this my last time or am I going to die in there? And there is one person says that I just get into a knot again. After all this, you know, when you think about what is going to happen. So this uh, 
we we understand that depression and i'm talking about depression mainly because studies and anxiety is much less so living the depression and heart failure both debilitating diseases having you know quite an impact on functional status and as mentioned earlier on the real and perceived sense of quality of life we know that depression and heart failure coexist uh, uh, but this this doesn't imply a causative factor at all and there is a uh, review in 2018 which shows the meta analysis 36 studies where depression is present in 21.5% of heart failure patients that is in some it is present in at least one in five patients with heart failure anxiety in around 13% but nearly 30% of patients have significant levels of anxiety so symptoms of anxiety is different from anxiety disorder just like symptoms of depression depressive symptoms are different from major depressive disorder these are different So let us. The same study also looks into outcomes of depression and anxiety in people with heart failure. I'll just mention this quickly. So there is a, it is an independent risk factor for mortality. There is increased healthcare use, higher rates of hospitalization, repeated hospitalization, at least 1.5 times more often, emergency room visits, and decreased survival. And that survival inversely is inversely associated with depression. severity so there's a lot of studies looking into outcomes and there's also one study which looks into specific factors which influences both depression and heart failure i'm talking about two factors which are predictors of onset of depressive symptoms in patients with heart failure and women are at a higher risk and social factors you know perception of medical care as a substantial economic burden very relevant to india and health status also being you know as chronic alcohol use and substance use again very relevant to kerala where we, uh, where i come from and india and of course lack of social support and living alone in the community very relevant that these are all independent predictors of emotional distress but i just want to now i'm going to start in the looking into distress as such so that we can go into a pathway of how we identify and assess i'm just going to introduce some concepts that we use as dimensions we are not looking because when we talk about depression and anxiety they are categories that psychiatrists actually diagnose but when you are in a specialty like cardiology or endocrinology or oncology you do not categorize them immediately isn't it you do not diagnose them so it is it is useful to understand dimensional way of assessing psychological distress so the term distress came from oncology from you know uh, the us they said they 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 say that screening for psychological distress is the first step step to the pathway to psychosocial care and routine screening is advised by all guidelines including nice guidelines in um, such specialties especially oncology and palliative care so i would think that distress would be the starting point anywhere where we suspect that there is depression anxiety the other um, concept is quality of life like mention but i think we should also mention about loss and grief and existential crisis and spiritual suffering that people have lost a meaning in life have lost connectedness with life or you know with the universe lost a purpose in life so there's a lot of issues that people grapple with and it is just not being sad or being anxious there's a lot of conflict within them just a picture to show you that there are five stages of grief and people all of us go through this when we face change or trauma so very important to know that people can actually get stuck in any one of these phases and then we see that there is an emotional issue i'll answer questions to this later i'm not going to into this in detail so the question is that is it normal for a person to worry or be sad after being diagnosed with cardiac disease especially now that we are talking about heart failure and all of us would agree yes any person would be worried or sad if we have a serious illness isn't it but what is the difference between normal worry so what is the difference between normal sadness and then the disorders that we talk about this is a dilemma that everyone faces when they are not trained to diagnose psychiatric disorders so for example in the outpatient when you are seeing a 71 year old with heart failure which is restricting his physical activity but comfortable at rest he's retired from work as a cleaner but in financial difficulties he's recently lost his son supported only by his wife he comes with sleep disturbance he's very edgy and he's getting irritable So I assume that in a cardiology OP, the first step would be to look into the you know the cardiac status, and then if there is something in that, the pathway will go like that. No, there will be not an attempt to look into why he is not sleeping, why he is getting irritable, why is he being edgy. So that is the crux here that we need to listen and communicate and explore further into this. So when is an emotional reaction identified as pathological? 
when it is so very simply put you can look into three points when it is out of proportion to the level of threat like when they have severe panic attacks or they are extremely careful and gloomy when it's the symptoms are persisting or they, they, there is deterioration of function when i mean function i mean the psychological functioning and not only the physical function and the intensity of symptoms are unacceptable regardless of the threat that is a person has continuous palpitations insomnia or low mood so this is like a framework that we can use you know this all of us can go through this we assume that we are in the green section being healthy with normal mood fluctuations we are able to cope we have only flu few sleep difficulties and when there is a change in our life we react to it m mildly you know there's just some sadness some overwhelmed fe feeling but we cope with it when the situation exacerbates when there is injury then you become pervasively sad pervasively sad hopeless there is more anxiety restless disturbed sleep you know increased aches and pains but when there is an illness state it again exacerbates into excessive anxiety leading to panic attacks depression wish to die like suicidal thoughts there could be substance use cannot fall asleep or wakes up early in the morning sleeping too much or sleeping too little so this is the dimension that we are looking into so when you know that a person is going through some emotional distress the questions that one can ask is you have to know only about three categories adjustment disorders a common category that we see in any specialty when a person cannot adjust there is a maladjustment process to in response to chronic stress it's usually short lived and there's a mixture of emotional symptoms and it's a labile state if it is part of depressive disorder there's a lot more of symptoms and minimum of 2 2 weeks if the if the severity of the symptom is not that much and you have the ones that i have marked with in red is that they are all psychological symptoms and not somatic symptoms because depression also has somatic symptoms which overlaps with heart failure like reduced energy reduced attention and concentration changes in body function sleep appetite everything can happen in any chronic illness but we are talking about some specific symptoms like depressed mood which is pervasive very profound loss of interest or enjoyment this called anhedonia self harm suicidal ideas ideas of hopelessness helplessness and unworthiness very important to elicit this or you should also look into anxiety disorders it's very difficult to apply strict criteria for anxiety disorders to persons with advanced life limiting disease and we also have to understand that anxiety can be part of adjustment disorder can be part of depressive disorder and it can be per se uh, a stand alone anxiety disorder like generalized anxiety disorder panic disorder etc so but this should be left to the you know the uh, specialist you the job for the role for the primary team would be probably to screen and identify that there is distress manage the distress and then try to refer when you cannot you know manage it some of the pointers for assessment is that you uh, you try to explore his understanding does he know about his illness how 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 severe it is does he worry about death does he worry about losses the loss of his son how is his relationship with his wife how did he cope in the initial stages of heart disease is there any report of his nature his personality being of a worrying type who supports him is there neglect these are the questions that we should ask and other risk factors like traumatic events in childhood chronic illness like in this person has negative life events like the loss of the son like i said personality traits female being more at risk very important in your history to look into past history of mental health disorders family history of mental health disorders including substance use disabling symptoms and of course recurrence of acute episodes and repeated you know hospitalizations so basic steps is your communication skills you should know how to listen appropriately and explore deeper into the issues like asking the right and appropriate questions and how to interpret the mood and symptoms of anxiety it is not very easy like for a mental health prof professional but it can be learned it's a learned skill it is not like something you have to get trained for a procedure if you start your using your communication skills well it will happen spontaneously further and further and one uh, easy aspect is to link the person's mood or symptoms of anxiety with the person's functioning like biological functioning sleep appetite sexual functioning social and occupational functioning and interpersonal functioning impairment in any of these domains reflects that there is the person is not coping well and he is not adjusting properly so that is a signal for you so 
you can use tools also you in research you see that screening is done mostly with you know with questionnaires and one of the commonest ones which i we can borrow from oncology is distress thermometer the snapshot i've given in, in the beside the text material i mean if anyone wants i can share it also we use use it a lot american heart association recommends routine screening with phq2 that is a patient health questionnaire and uh, then follow up with phq9 2 and 9 and the scoring also is given for that with huge score more than 3 for phq2 and between 10 and 27 for 9 indicates moderate to severe similarly for anxiety gad2 and gad7 there is a new cardiac distress inventory being developed in australia and they say that there should be specific cardiac distress tools developed just like this thermometer was developed in oncology so we should wait for how it is going to you know be used and you know shared but does screening help yes it does help in identification it initiates a pathway for psychosocial care but we should remember that the gold standard is a detailed mental status examination then how do we manage you can look at this ladder you know this is adapted from the who analgesic ladder when you are normal when you when we assume that we are normal we use the supports from the family and the community when it's mild the medical team or the cardiology team and your social worker if you have a social worker can support the person this is according to the distress thermometer that is this is less than 5 when the person scores more than 5 that is moderate to severe then you have to have more specialized care even up to moderate you know you can you can manage on your own you can even start some therapy on your own and start medications if you uh, want to in terms of antidepressants but if it is severe you have to refer them to a specialist or a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist so this is just a framework again showing how a person can follow an algorithm in terms you know that you can see the distress thermometer beneath and how in each if this the person is scoring less than 5 it is mainly the psycho psychological measures and if it is more than 5 then you have the pharmacological intervention but when there is no improvement with both these measures and when there is agitation confusion disorientation psychotic features like hallucinations delusions or suicidal ideas you have to refer them to a specialist so how can i you know in a cardiology team support someone in distress your therapeutic interaction is very important like i said maintaining boundaries but maintaining closeness how to educate about psychological issues how do you normalize the normal emotional reactions to enhance coping competence by allowing them to ventilate and validate validation is how you listen to them with a non judgmental and non confrontational method how do you help them to manage crisis like a you know an acute episode of anxiety how do you help them solve have a mutual kind of conversation about and agree an agenda where the patient kind of identifies what his problems are and you facilitate the process of solving how can you use your own patients and families to support other patients who have acute issues You, there is a need to address somatic symptoms because as i said before depression anxiety and heart failure can have similar psycho, uh, somatic symptoms like fatigue less energy sleep issues the drugs that we use are the recommended drugs are usually the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors carefully use benzodiazepines for moderate to severe distress so we have evidence where you know the mood hf study and the sad heart study in uh, congestive heart failure uh we studied on ssris especially sertraline and ciprofloxacin and uh, came out with a report that they were not effective in reducing symptoms of depression nor improving cardiac outcomes but still the recommendation is that we start with ssri with a small dose and titrate up we have to remember that it takes at least 2 weeks for specific changes the common ones used are ciprofloxacin and sertraline no major side effects expected except for nervousness in the initial few days some reports of gastric bleeding, bleeding. older people have a propensity to have hyponatremia and of course the cardiologist you, you would know the qtc interval is also you know prolonged with ssris some of them other useful medications are like mirtazapine which is a nasa very useful side effects are less and it's very useful for people with sleep disturbance you can even start with the smallest dose of 7.5 mg mixed reports about snri that is which acts on serotonin as well as norepinephrine when lefaxin and duloxetine which have some effects on the cardiovascular status so you have to be careful tricyclics with its side effects should be avoided generally and careful use of benzodiazepines only for short periods 
for psychological interventions, cognitive behavioral therapy is the only therapy tested systematically with beneficial effects. The other methods mentioned are relaxation methods, distraction methods, especially for anxiety. But as I said before, we have to use other skills in looking into interpersonal and family relationships, conflict resolution, use of advanced communication skills. These are some of the therapies which have new evidence in palliative care, and I think these should be useful in any chronic illnesses like meaning centered therapy, dignity therapy, brief guided self help uh, intervention, where you know all this brings in goes into much more bigger di dimensions than just depression and anxiety. So, like we say in, pal in palliative care, we say pain, a person should never have pain. Similarly, we also say that a person should never have distress. We should not allow any person to have any distress. I'm ending this slide with a quote from Dr. Bernard Long, who just passed away recently. And he ends with saying that, see, the last sentence is, use your communication skills well. Talk, which can be therapeutic, is one of the underrated tools in a physician's armamentarium. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chitra, for that wonderful uh, talk. There are some questions in the um, chat box. Uh, uh, yeah, one is uh, sedative, in, in, uh, safe sedative in insomnia and heart failure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we talk about insomnia, uh, rather than just giving a sedative, I would advise uh, um, exploring wh why it is so. What is the cause? Of Usually, it is due to anxiety or uh, some mood changes. So if it is because of that, usually, commonly, these are the ones which cause, to, cause sleep disturbances. So giving a benzodiazepine or giving a hypnotic necessarily doesn't actually address the core issue. So we have to address the mood or the anxiety clearly. And if so, you start with an SSRI. You can additionally, you can add a benzodiazepine looking at his you know, respiratory function for a short period of time and then maintain only on SSRI. I would not advise hypnotics for a long period of time, sir. I would okay. not advise uh, prescribing benzodiazepines routinely for uh, sleep disturbance or any other hypnotic, just like that. Okay. Especially in uh, people with comorbidities because a lot of side effects or you know drug interactions can happen. Uh, will melatonin uh, help in this situation? Yes, melatonin can help. Uh, uh, melatonin can help, especially in older people when there is also, a, you know, a dis dysfunctional sleep rhythm, you know, circadian rhythm. Uh, you can actually start melatonin, which is safe. But the, the only aspect is that if, uh, if the sleep disturbance is due to depression or anxiety or, you know, due to mood changes, again, melatonin might not have a dramatic effect on, it might improve sleep a bit, but it will not really improve the anxiety. So better to go behind and look at what is really causing the sleep disturbance and then go ahead. Dr. Chitra, some papers on uh, inflammation associated with this uh, inflammatory mark associated depression. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, there is, I mean, of course, I did look into, I didn't bring that into the slides. There, are, There is evidence that there is a link between inflammation, which is a common kind of substrate for both depression and heart failure. But we do not do that routinely at all. So, I mean, it is not practical to do that, maybe for research purposes, but not for a routine clinical practice. Uh, Dr. Chitra, I practice medicine in uh, Punjab, and uh, I always thought we have the highest uh, consumption of alcohol. But lately, I read even Kerala yes. possibly has per capita consumption of alcohol is more. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We, <laughs> we, have, we have actually surpassed you. <laughs> yeah. If we are competing. So, <laughs> <laughs> and a very common question which bothers me and which I am often not uh, I know heart failure specialists uh, Hari Haran and uh, Dr. Chopra are going to scorn at me but this is an issue which a lot of uh, patients uh, ask me uh, can they have a drink um, uh, we all know it's a myocardial depressant and a lot of people here take opium also uh, 
actually uh, not a good clinical practice but i cannot stop opium so i uh, that part of the answer is not very difficult for me i tell them reduce it and carry on because i know opium is not a myocardial depressant and it's not so easy for some of these who have been addicted what's your comment on alcohol how badly do, does does it do what all harms would it do to the reactive kind of a depression or anxiety which patients with chronic disorders have leave aside the myocardial depressant effect we can leave that for dr hariharan and dr chop to look at okay sir i mean you're also talking to a palliative care uh, person so i would be taking a uh, decision like you if the person is especially in advanced heart failure and he has uh, impaired quality of life and this is one of the factors which can improve his quality of life with a limited the uh, expectation of longevity i would say have a uh, drink but not too much i would advise be safe but as a psychiatrist i would also look into if they are in the in early stages of heart failure probably i would look into how it is affecting his behavior because alcohol use actually uh, substance use disorders is falls in the spectrum of you know psychiatric disorders and it is very clearly linked with mood disorders as well as well as personalities so uh, we'll have to assess i mean if if suppose it is impinging on his behavior and his functioning in as i men mentioned all the the biological the occupational the interpersonal functioning then we'll have to deal with it we have to address it clearly it depends on which phase how much it is affecting and how far it is affecting dr not good i hope it, i hope that was helpful dr wonder there is uh, on a lighter way you know there's a statement one drink makes a new man out of you but the problem is that new man wants another drink <laughs> Yeah, I think the way uh, people, uh, many of the people drink in Kerala, it's like a binge drinking. They take yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. alcohol at a very short period, and that uh, lead on to uh, higher heart rate. That uh, is exactly uh, high, my. I higher, want. Yeah. yeah higher blood pressure. That... Higher blood pressure, and they lead on to arrhythmias and all, which will improve, uh, worsen the prognosis of heart failure. So I think if you uh, give permission to have one drink, I think they will go on, and I don't. <laughs> yeah, you, especially. That, I especially, said yeah. that is a palliative kind of approach, uh, Harry. Yeah. I mean, especially only when you ha- you don't expect much of a longevity. He's in an advanced stage. It you are looking into yeah. end of life issues. Then you want to improve his okay. quality of life. Yeah. I'm yeah. not saying everyone. Okay, go and have a drink. No, not at all. Please, please. Especially so. we should say that drinking uh, alcohol or any substance use reflects their behavior and so we have to look into that it it also extends to your next talk okay this is the desire and takes away the performance absolutely <laughs> that is true sir uh, well uh, can we do we have the permission uh, of uh, yeah, sure. can we go on to the third talk please yes sir please okay we had uh, everybody will agree we had excellent talks and lovely discussion on the first two masterly presentations and we have an equally distinguished uh, third speaker today uh, dr tiny jarsma she happens to be the editor in chief of the european uh, journal of cardiovascular nursing she has she works in sweden and also um, uh, teaches possibly in uh, netherlands also Uh, she has research uh, focus on the topic uh, that uh, she is going to address today uh, quality of life of heart failure patients and as dr ayengar said uh, this is a very important aspect of quality of life uh, of any human being so looking forward to a uh, talk by dr uh, tiny jarsma over to dr tiny thank you now of course i cannot find my slide yeah i have it here sorry we practice then all you can all, you will always see um yeah this one more. <clears throat> is it okay like this yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Fine. Good. Good. yeah thank you thank you for the invitation and also the nice introduction um i'm very happy to talk today about sexual dysfunction in heart failure patients and um I first bring you greetings from a snowy Sweden. I know the temperatures are different in India, but we had new snow today, so we have a little different situation. Um but of course very happy to be with you today. I will use uh, several sources of evidence and recommendations uh that I have on this slide uh and if it's you know goes goes too quick you can always mail me. I can send them to you. So actually 
there is written quite a lot on this subject. And we always think, well, there's not so much known about sexual function and heart failure. And there are quite a lot of recommendations and statements of professional organizations that we can use. And I will refer to them through, throughout my talk. So like we discussed the sleep and also the anxiety and depression, uh, heart failure patients also often suffer from um, sexual problems. And I, I will play a little bit with these terminologies, sexual dysfunction, sexual problems, erectile dysfunction, sexual health, which of course are all different things. And I will go into that a little bit uh, more uh, in detail. But what we know from our uh, studies, that is uh, a lot of patients with heart failure have marked decrease in interest and frequency of sexual activity. Uh, we found numbers of 75%, 92% decreased frequency, 81% loss of interest, uh, change in sexual activity, etc. cetera. Uh, and this is also a study that showed uh, it was the group I worked with in the Netherlands that the heart failure patients with a partner and younger patients reported significantly more sex sexual problems compared to healthy age and gender matched individuals. So we did like, we, we compared them with people from the non-heart failure population. And this is a little more in detail on the erectile dysfunction that and this is an interesting paper that also says that, of course, a lot of people getting older also have erectile dysfunction, ED, uh, people with diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, heart failure is quite high, obesity, hyperlipidemia, and depression. And like we saw in the previous slide, and I, I'm sure that if you have a bad sleep, you also have a higher uh, number of problems with, uh, with sexual function. So this is a very complicated group of patients. It's uh, not easy to, to discuss. It's not easy to treat. Uh, and I will come in, uh, go into detail a little bit more on all these comorbidities that, of course, also influence sexual function. Um, so to take it a little broader than sex erectile dysfunction, because that is studied a lot, because it's easy to define and describe. Um, but we actually uh, asked people uh, from a normal heart failure cohort. Um, uh, this was 62% male and the mean age was 68. Uh, what kind of problems do you have? And people would say, well, I have problems with sexual functions. I cannot do it anymore. I have no interest, no arousal, problems with erection, problems with vaginal dryness, problems with an orgasm or other problems. So it's not only straightforward that people say, I have erectile dysfunction. And I think that is important in our practice to think about. And when we uh, discussed a little bit before, I said people, yeah, it, maybe in India, it's more difficult to, to discuss. But I think all countries would say that, even the Netherlands, where people are often maybe thought of so free, it is an issue that we don't discuss it. And if we discuss it, we are not open. What is your sexual problem? So it's more than erectile dysfunction. That's my little message, first message here. Because if we ask patients then, what are the reasons then that you have these sexual problems? And we ask both people in the, in the community, community controls, and we ask heart failure patients, uh, and they were age and gender matched, uh, that of course people with heart failure have more often shortness of breath, but they also refer it as a reason for their sexual problems, which of course is not strange, but important to know that the symptoms of heart failure are hindering them to have sex as they want. Fatigue, uh, pain was the same as in the community control and heart failure patients, anxiety, but also partner's anxiety played a role, but not so big here. Medication was uh, um, acknowledged or recognized by patients as, as uh, the reason for their uh, sexual problems. And this is, of course, all self-reported, but this is how we see patients in our clinics. And they asked, they said, it is my limited circulation. So people have some idea that it has to do something with their 
their heart and the, the, their, uh, yeah, their circulation. So I think nice to know that people have these ideas, how, how that did it happen, the sexual problem? What's the reason? But just a little step back, um, sex is more than only having intercourse. Uh, we all know that. And it's important also to consider this in our patients. What is sexual health? It is a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being in, related to, in relation to sexuality. It is not merely the absence of dysfunction. So if people still can do it, they can still have not, a, a not good sexual health. And it requires a positive and respectful approach. Uh, that was also uh, discussed by the previous speaker. Uh, and also, uh, it is also includes sexual relationship and the possibility of having pleasure and safe sexual experiences. Um, and I, I like this picture a lot. Uh, for this, for, for some people, this is really what's it about, and they want to talk about this. Well, we, you probably will not say, can we still have a cup of tea in the bath together? But some people would have questions that are not related to an orgasm, but uh, that are related to intimacy, which also are important to discuss. And if we don't discuss this or not talk about it or say, oh, no, I cannot talk about this or not open, we can take a lot away from the quality of life uh, of patients, couples. So this is one of the statements I would like you to, uh, you know, to look up if you if you are interested in this this subject. It's the scientific statement from the American Heart Association, and this is on sexual activity and cardiovascular disease. Um, and they have specific parts are general parts in this statement, but also specific disease specific parts. Um, and from that one, I took one statement that often is asked by patients, is it dangerous to have sex again? And in this in this article from Levine, they have gathered, or it's, it's a state consensus statement, all the information that's about that. And uh, this is uh, quite a complicated, I, I probably would not say this in, in this kind of words to patients, but for us to know that uh, that it is very rare that people die uh, from uh, intercourse, it could happen, um, and it, it's a very low risk. And I always try to sort of explain this last risk statement, and I it's very low. So even if people then, for example, get physical active in a, after their myocardial infarction or, or their heart disease, this risk will even get lower. So it is a very low risk. And of course, it's in people's minds. That happens in movies. So people get like a heart attack while they're having sex, etc. Uh, but if you really look at the risk, it is low. It's not zero, but it's very low. And what people also often ask is how much burden then is it to the, is it to the heart? And this is some kind of, some, something that you can share with your patients, if they ask about it, um, that uh, it's it's it is not a heavy burden on the heart. So if you if you look at systolic and diastolic systemic uh, arterial blood pressure and heart rate during foreplay, that this increased mildly. Mildly, then during sexual arousal, it's more modest increasing, but it's it's very transiently and it occurs transiently. And then an orgasm, which is in most of us only 10 to 15 seconds, uh, greatest increase, but rapid, very rapid return to baseline. So it's not a severe strength on the heart for a long time. Uh, it's the same for men and women. And also if you think about heart rate, they said it rarely exceeds 130 beats per minute and, and systolic blood pressure exceeds uh, not that does not exceed 170 uh, millivolt uh, of, of the blood pressure. So, and that was in normal tensives. And then, if we look at, of course, heart failure patients are often on beta blockers. So, the story is different. But if you think about a burden to the heart, it is not a, a huge burden. And then, um, what we often say is that sexual activity is comparable to mild to moderate physical activity. And then we say the range of three to four metabolic equivalents, so METs. So uh, I will have a little examples later. 
And what we often say is climbing two flights of stairs or walking briskly for a short duration. And that is in the healthy young. Uh, so the American Heart Association statement uh, said that uh, it's more reasonable to say that sexual activity is, is equal, equivalent to mild to moderate physical activity in the range to three to five minutes. So what does that say, the MET? Well, if you just stand up and do nothing, it's what you, you used one met metabolic equivalent of the task. So that's MET. So if you think about, if you start here to say walking is 3.3 METs, walking stairs is three to five METs, gardening is three METs, and then scrubbing floors is 7.5 METs. So you have like a sort of comparison of what is the burden to your uh, energy or the energy requirement is. And then if you look at sexual activities, self-stimulation is 1.7 MET. So you have different uh, uh, women on top is 2.5 and uh, men on top is 3.3. I never, I always wonder how did they find that out? But uh, that's their, uh, the, uh, uh, estimation of the en energy requirement. And then like American Heart Association said that for sexual activities, uh, uh, it would say in all the cardiac patients, we would say five met. So what does that mean for if you discuss it with your patients? That is often what we say. If you can walk up two flights of stairs without uh, severe complaints or symptoms, you can safely have sex. Or if you do a brisk walk, for uh, 10 minutes, you can have safely sex. Uh, of course, it's some for some people that really does not work. They would say, well, I can walk up a stair, et cetera. So it is, again, very tailored advice you have to give. But if it helps you to think about how much energy it takes, this is the energy it will take. Probably if you have sex while scrubbing the floors, it would take more energy. But uh, I would not advise that probably to the heart failure patients. So in one of the other statements, it also said that sexual activity is reasonable. So it is uh, safe for patients with uh, compensated and or mild heart failure, NIA plus e, uh, one or two. Uh, and they have the level of evidence also stated here. So they especially say like, if, if people are stable and, and or have mild heart failure, they can safely have sex. And also, uh, it is not advised for patients with decompensated or advanced heart failure, but then you have to read further until their condition is stabilized and optimally managed. So it does not say that patients with NIA class three or four cannot do sexual activity. They just have to be stable and op optimally managed. And of course, there's no trials on that. So it's level of evidence C. And in an other statement, and there I would like to take it from there again, that it is difficult, it is important during sexual counseling that uh, to discuss this, for example, the, uh, the resumption of sexual activity, because people want to, to talk about it, they have questions, not all patients, of course, but it is uh, important. And I will talk a little bit later on how you could address it uh, with patients. So it, our recommendations, we have recommendations on ACE inhibitors and ARNI and on CRT. We also have recommendations on sexual counseling. So uh, I think we should really do that. Oh, sorry. So then if we go to treatment uh, very shortly, because this is not my level of expertise, uh, I'm not a sexuologist, uh, but in treatment, we have to go back to one of my first slides that there is a lot of things happening if people have sexual problems. So some people have, uh, like you see here, comorbidity. Uh, people, some people are older, may have symptoms, medical treatment that can affect their sexual function uh, or does not, or it can affect. Uh, people might have a pacemaker, defibrillator, might be might be afraid it will go off during sex. So there are a lot of things that we have to consider when counseling or when looking at sexual problems. If we then want to go to treatment, 
uh, for example, with PD-5 inhibitors or other uh, uh, therapies, uh, this Princeton uh, consensus is very uh, good to look at because what they do here is they say after an inquiry and after clinical e evaluation, you can divide people in low risk, high risk or intermediate risk uh, for sexual activity. Uh, or for, for sorry, for, for uh, worse outcomes during sexual activity. Uh, and then based on if people are in a low risk, you can start uh, treating if, if uh, needed, or you can advise people to, to resume sex. If they have high risk, they have to be treated uh, first before they can uh, be treated for, for um for sexual dysfunction. And if they're in intermediate risk, you have to uh, assess more deeper or treat them until they go to one of these uh, categories. And just very shortly, I will not read them all to you, but just find our heart failure patients in these risks. So low risk patients are uh, people, for example, um, the low risk group is limited to patients for whom sexual activity does not represent significant cardiac risk. And these patients can generally perform exercise or moderate intensive uh, exercise without symptoms. Uh, and for example, these are people with controlled hypertension. And also here you can see in NIA class one and two. Oh. If we then go to the high risk patients, these are patients that have uh, a significant risk with sexual activity uh, and these are, for example, patients in, in class four, near class four. Um, and then the intermediate risk, of course, is everything in, be in between. But here you can find our near class three uh, patients and patients that are not optimally treated. So if you want to stratify them in high and low risk and then start treatment, you can use this uh, consensus statement from Princeton very well. And then like you can hear, you, you can see here, you can uh, start uh, training or, uh, or a treatment or uh, advice to, to resume sexual activity. But of course, it's more than just prescription of medication or initiating treatment. It's also talk to your patients about it. And I think that is the most important. People want to know, people want to discuss, they have questions. And this is also a very nice and practical document. What can you talk about? What can you tell them? What is, what is nonsense? What is really interesting to speak to patients about? What are myths? Uh, so uh, I, would, I would also recommend this to you. So do patients want to talk about it? And then we know that they want to do. And we looked in our study population of a huge study, coach study, and only 9% patients reported to have received information, but 70% reported to need information. So it's also not the case that everybody standard wants information, but still 17%. And patients who wish to be treated was 10%, and they were mostly men, and they had problems with erection arousal and having uh, uh, a lot of them use beta blockers, and uh, they um, were uh, just have to see, using nitrates. So that is an extra uh, problem, of course, if you want to use PD-5 inhibitors. So a lot of people have questions, but they are not getting any information. So how can you then address this seriously? And that, of course, is a webinar in itself, so I will not go into my, but give a little few pointers. Good assessment is important. More than once, not think, oh, I talked about it five years ago. I will never speak about it again. Just ask people and also do patient and, and partner tailored information. So it's, it's very important to see what is the situation of this patient and this partner and uh, how are they living? How is their relationship? A general education could help be helpful and open and proactive attitude. Talk about lifestyle. It could fit there. And also, of course, important, you have time, you have a private room, and you have personal attention and personal word use also. Uh, and interventions that have been successful is cardiac rehab. 
cognitive behavioral therapy and also social support that included partners and spouses. There are not so many intervention studies actually. And we have a very nice website, it's called Heart Failure Matters, and then we have a specific uh, area that there you can find information. That can sometimes help to open the discussions. So just to close down, like you think, well, I don't think people want to talk about it. This is an interesting study from, from the Netherlands where they interviewed 290 patients with uh, cardiac problems, so not specific. Um, uh, art for your patients, but they asked if the cardiologist would ask you about your sexual function during consultation, how would you feel about that? And if you would see here in blue, almost half said, well, I don't mind. And 31% would say, well, it seems logical to ask. And here on the, the, in red, people even expected, I think it's necessary for a complete consultation. So people actually expected from us to speak about it. And what do you, what do they expect from you? And these were people with, with uh, uh, erectile dysfunction. And it's not that people, you know, expect like deep going counseling. People would say, give me some advice how to deal it. Give me explanation how it works. Give me information. Give me some information and think about it. So it's a lot of informing and discussing. People don't, you know, demand pills right away or other treatment. So what do people want to know? And in this study I mentioned before, that's also not things that, you know, we would think, well, you need the Nobel Prize for finding out what people want to know. This is, and these things we know, general advice and support. Sometimes they want referral information for the partner, dangers, exertion. So how much, uh, what will it, uh, how much uh, will it cost for the body, the energy requirements, expected consequences of heart failure, medication, and reasons for increased or decreased sexual interest, possibilities for improvement, risks, medication, possibilities, what can I still do and how to prevent problems? Well, these things you know. So I think we really have no uh, reason not to discuss this with patients. And otherwise we can of course always consult another person. So I would like to end saying, please take time and courage to discuss this. And uh, I think it will mean a lot for your heart for your patients and their uh, partners. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jasper. Lovely talk. Uh, discussing, uh, making us aware and conscious that patients want information and advice and uh, there is so much left uh, actually to be discussed uh, during our usual consultations, which we presume we have done a good job and we've discussed, but patients have in their minds uh, so many of these day-to-day -day issues, which uh, we as clinicians, uh, as service providers need to address to our patients. And this of course is a very important issue uh, that you addressed and Dr. Chitra did address. Uh, the psychological aspects. Uh, the two have, I think, uh, bearing, uh, I mean, uh, on sexual uh, dysfunction, there is a psychological aspect, which is a huge factor. Uh, these people are often depressed and they are, they've lost their confidence, which, as you rightly said, if they can walk for two uh, flights of uh, stairs or something like that, you give them some confidence and give them uh, an estimation of how much they can do. That will really be very useful. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Tiny, for that excellent talk. I think you rightly said uh, in one of your papers that uh, uh, usually the patient is a bit embarrassed to put up his or her sexual problems to the doctor, or patient feels that doctor will be embarrassed if you ask the question of sexual dysfunction. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a very good question um, because we often call it like it is this silent thing in the room that either the patient does not want to discuss because they might think they embarrass the doctor and the doctor does not talk about it because they think they embarrass the patient. So it's, everybody sort of goes around this subject and often people are quite relieved if you ask about it, because what we ask about how much they pee and how much, you know, whatever they, if they still go to the toilet, but 
you know, just not asking about sexual function, it's also a little strange. So, uh, of course, it's also sometimes our own uh, feeling of, oh, I don't know, I don't know this patient or, um, but I, I also feel it sometimes liberating just to say, for example, now you have all this medication and you have, we gave you advice and uh, if there's any things that you feel you want to discuss with us, and this could be everything. It could be about symptoms, about sexual function, or about your sex life. Please come to me. Then you mention it, you, you leave it there, and you open the door for the patient next time. Oh, yeah, doctor, you said that. Oh, I'm very embarrassed. But you open the door. And I think that is most important, that as the more normal we are about it, the more normal it is. The thing I wanted to bring this point was, uh, you know, Indians being more traditional and customary, we also advise them uh, to avoid extramarital sex because it brings in more stress. Yeah, well, I have to be honest. When I was in the American Heart Association statement, they were very, uh, yeah, strict or strict. They were very pushy on that. It should be in. And I, I was a little bit more... Um, I said, well, there is no evidence for, you know, a lot of what should the woman be on top or should you have with your own partner and same sex partners? Not, there's no evidence at all. Of course, there are, is this study, this autopsy study that most of the men they had there had sex during an extramarital relationship. But that is always, you can also think about it. It is extra stress, but it's often on top of, they have had alcohol, they have had maybe a big meal, they have been, they're tired, and then they have maybe an extramarital relationship. So to be very strict on that, uh, I think it, you should see it in, in the whole context. Because if a person has an extramarital relationship already for four years, I think, who am I then to say, well, you, you don't have an extramarital relationship. So I think it's in the whole context. So if it is very stressful and it is on top of all kinds of other stress, I would just say, well, I would not advise that. But I don't feel that I have to judge how uh, people have sex. Thank you. Uh, two drugs uh, we have to be careful are the beta blockers and uh, aldosterone blockers, which can affect the sexual function. Uh, so we have to be careful and we can always uh, ask the uh, patient, when the patient presents with an uh, erectile dysfunction, we can uh, down titrate these drugs and see whether it will help. Maybe yes, I, and sometimes it helps to switch from one to the other so you can also see if it was the beta blocker, because sometimes people think it is the beta blocker, but it is not the beta blocker. So that takes a little bit, and I know we're all very busy, but sometimes that takes a little time. So to maybe to go for one, in, stay in the same class, but go to another brand uh, might help. Uh, and, and also to outweigh what is the risk uh, and what is this, the sacrifice to take away the beta blocker? Is it the sacrifice to have a better quality of life or for a shorter life? And that, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that, you know, some, some people feel very strong about, but uh, these are drugs that are known to affect sexual function. Then again, if you look to the, the trials and the evidence, it's very low, uh, but it is known to be effective. And often um, also if people know they have a beta blocker and they read in the, uh, how you say, the uh, information, then people get afraid. But of course, we cannot keep the information away from people. Um, so, so that is often a difficult uh, thing. Yeah. It's probably the nocebo effect, what you're talking about. Yes. And probably some of the newer beta blockers may not have this problem. Second, exactly. Diuretics, thiazide diuretics, digoxin. Yes. Antidepressants. Antidepressants. Especially what we suggested for depression, the SSRIs, uh, some of them can cause uh, decreased libido. So we have to be, we should not just over prescribe SSRIs if they come with uh, assuming that depression is causing the sexual dysfunction and end up with more, you know, problems with the sexual functioning than 
uh, already is. So, so I would suggest again, like uh, Dr. Tiny said, explore deeply into the issue. You know, have your uh, communication uh, very well be appropriate and try to find out what is beneath these whole issues. Yeah, and I also think I, I had once also a patient who really had the problems and they, he felt bad about it. And then we had a lot of uh, attempts to, to, that, to use uh, sildenafil and it, it worked well. And then I just thought, okay, problem solved. And then he said, well, you know, I feel bad about buy because we have in the Netherlands, you had to buy it. Uh, you have to buy this medication. That feels very bad for me. So I have to buy medication to have sex. No, I don't want it. So there I also felt like we sort of did not, as clinicians, we were only worried about the nitrates and getting the nitrates off board and starting with Viagra and how will his heart. But then he was more worried about this feeling of have, needing pills to have sex. So he did not feel good about it at all. So, so I think that is also a little bit in this session that um, we have to really take a little bit more time to talk to patients, what it means for them. Dr. Jasmine, can I ask you, do you find that in different cultures and different societies, the approaches or the way that you communicate and the way that the patient wants to communicate with you is different? Even in your country, there would be people from different ethnic uh, oh, areas yeah. or different regions. Do you find yes, that there yes. is in communication with them? Because in India, as Dr. Ayengar said, it's a lot more conservative society. So uh, what is your take on that? Yeah, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, th these things like, like, like sex and also I, I work a lot in palliative care, sex and death is something too difficult to talk about and also different approaches from culture. Um, but there, and maybe I am naive just to say that you can also have that in your culture and say, I realize we're from different cultures or, uh, but it might be difficult or it might be important for you to discuss certain issues, relationship, intimacy, sexual things, please feel free to come and talk about it. So I think then again, you open the door and you recognize like my culture is different, but I'm open for your questions. Uh, and it's the same. We always have pro uh, questions of, about people say, well, I cannot talk to people that have like a different sexual, uh, uh, how do you say it, sexual relationship. Uh, you know, like I cannot do that. I don't know anything about homosexuals or something. So then I just also feel like you can say that. You can say, I, I'm not homosexual. I don't know how, what your questions be, but maybe you have specific questions. If you have that, I can find it out for you. So I think that's the most best thing because if you pretend to know everything from all the cultures, we never know. About, but I think if we recognize this might be an issue. And I also have to say sometimes I also have been sitting there with a young couple. I can, sh I can share this. And I, I, I was a very young couple and they were on their way out after consultation, heart failure medication. And then I said, maybe you might have, you know, in future or now issues with our questions about sexual relationship, please feel free. And then they just started to laugh and did not stop for five minutes. So then of course, as a healthcare professional, I thought, oh my God, what did I say? So you have sometimes these experiences that you, but then I thought they know, that can happen. They probably thought this old woman is talking to us about sex. We don't want to talk about it. But at least I opened the door for them. And if they had problems, maybe in a year, they could come to me or someone else. Uh, regarding the use of uh, phosphodiesterase uh, 5 inhibitors, we have to be, uh, uh, we have to advise the patients regarding use of nitrates. Uh, the hydrolysis nitrate combination and also the rioseguat, the new pulmonary vasodilator. These are uh, contraindications. So. Yes. And I think, therefore, it is extra important that we're open about it because if people go surfing around the internet and just buy it online and do not know the interaction with medication, uh, worse things can happen. So I think it is important that we give the opportunity to talk about it and then we can be 
uh, help them to find the right medication or uh, at, at least be, be aware of the difficulties. Can I say something? Uh, I just want to say that uh, Dr. Chitra rightly mentioned, we need to regain the lost art of healing as Dr. Bernard used to mention. Second is just a lighter vein to the organizers to arrange the sequence of these talks in a different manner. Start with the sex and then the mood. Because you have managed sex, you get good sleep, no disorder breathing, and you get up with a good mood. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to say something about that, but then I thought, uh, because often we, you know, we're in the end, sex is a little bit in the end. So, but then I thought I could not get it well together. Did it, so, but you did it very well to start with uh, sex and then have good sleep and then you feel better. I think it's very good. So, uh, can Dr. Chopra summarize? I think we had lovely discussion and uh, at least as clinicians, uh, uh, some of us will now definitely, uh, uh, Dr. Tiny, open up more with our patients and spend a little bit more time. And uh, our patients will be happier with us, I'm sure. I think these were three excellent talks. And as I said, right in the beginning, many of these questions are either not, uh, I mean, we as clinicians, at least in India, maybe don't spend enough time in discussing about depression and uh, sleep disorders and sexual activity. But for patients' lifestyle, all these are extremely important. They improve the quality of life. And uh, Dr. Jasma, one of the methods that we use, you know, uh, the conversation is not about sexual activity, but you ask them that do you have any problems in your personal relationships? Many times, you know, so you avoid the S word. So then they open up and then they come and say, okay, you know, or maybe one person will come back and say that this is the problem. So many times you, there are small nuances that you can uh, play upon. But yeah. I think it was an excellent session. All of us, I'm sure, learned a lot about it. And thank you so much. Thanks, uh, Tiny, and thanks to the other two speakers who I think they have left by now. Hari, over oh, to you. Dr. Chitra, Dr. Chitra is there, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chitra, yeah. Thank you so much. You know, thank, you, so thank you, thank you. Yes. Thank yeah, you so I, I fully agree with. Uh, it was a wonderful session. When we planned the session, uh, we thought that these are the topics which are not uh, usually discussed. We wanted uh, so we had an excellent uh, faculty and we had a very good discussion. And thanks to everyone. Next uh, uh, month we will come with another interesting topics. Uh, till then, bye from all of us from Heart Failure Association. Thank you and good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. So, Hari went off very well, I think. Yeah, sir. That was good. Any idea? Uh, 350. <laughs>